property. So without further ado, let me introduce tonight's speaker. John Bates is the curator of birds at the Field Museum, and he's been doing that for the past 26 years. John may not know it, but he's about to set a record for the Lake Cook speaker invited back sooner than any other speaker we've had in the 12 or 15 years I've been involved with this chapter. He spoke to us last March about the role of museum bird collections in documenting change in bird health. In corresponding with John since then, I learned about his adventures researching penguins in the South Polar region. And I know nobody likes penguins. <laughs> Everybody likes penguins. So I had to invite him back to tell the tale. John grew up in Tucson, which is why I think he became a lifelong birder. He and his students studied the evolution and maintenance of biodiversity, focusing primarily on South America and Africa. This research includes analysis of genetic and traditional museum specimen data, there goes your specimens, to address questions at the tips of tree of life for birds and other vertebrates. He's actively interested in training new generations of biodiversity scientists in the regions everywhere he works. John, the floor is yours and the penguins, of course. Thanks, Rena. It's uh, great to be here and uh, thank you all for coming. And I'm gonna go ahead and get right into it because I've got a lot to show. And and uh, Sonny and I did a little work checking things out with uh, the presentation. I've got a few clips in here. And so with a little luck, they'll work. So yeah, I wanna take you on a expedition that I went on in January. Um, and let me go into, and if you know the Field Museum and, and know our various logos, this is one of the things that one of the slogans that we have, Earth, we're on it, and they have this picture of the Earth. And in this particular picture, you know, you can see South America. That's a place I've spent a lot of time. As Rena said, I've spent a lot of time in Africa, too, as well as North America. But uh, a number of years ago, the museum was... Uh, uh, was allowed to create an endowment through a donation from the Pritzker family um, to create a center for meteoritics and polar studies. And so what I'm going to talk today about is a completely different perspective on the planet. And you can start realizing that that this is one of the most remote parts of the world. Um, it's basically the features are ocean, uh, ice, rock, uh, and snow. And so you know, it's an incredible area. And it's, to be honest with you, it's an area that I never necessarily thought I would be able to go to. But we had this uh, uh, endowment for polar studies and several colleagues of mine, Susma Reddy and uh, her postdoc at the time, Jane Younger, came to me and said, we'd like to write a trip, uh, a, a proposal to study penguins. And Jane is a penguin researcher. She's Australian. Um, and so we did, and it got funded in 2019. And of course, what happened in 2021, January, which is when we were supposed to go originally, was the trip got scuttled um, pretty early on and we knew we, we couldn't do it. And then 2022 rolled around and we thought, maybe we can pull it off. And, and it, to be honest with you, it was touch and go. We left Chicago on December 26th, which was a Sunday. And the guy in the middle there, Jacob Drucker, one of my former graduate students needed to get a uh, PCR COVID test, and we probably found the only place in the entire northern part of uh, the region that was actually giving them that day and giving results, and we were able to get on flights. And the crew came from all over the place. So there, there were nine of us on the research team. Uh, there were several uh, folks from, and I'll talk about the, the women who are actually the penguin researchers on this trip. All the, the four guys that were on the trip were all there basically to help out. Um, but uh, we met up in, uh, we all came into Heathrow Airport in the UK, and we had to travel out to uh, an Air Force base called uh, Breeze Norton. And from there, we were able to catch an Air Force plane, which is the only way you can get down to the Falklands right now. And it landed in Senegal to refuel and then got to the Falklands. And we were put in a bus at the Air Force Base and driven an hour into the, Falk the capital of the Falklands, which is Stanley. And we boarded this sailboat and the money that, that we got from the Pritzker Fund was, was uh, almost entirely going towards chartering this specific sailboat, which is a very special thing. It's called the Vincent of Antarctica. Um, it's designed for uh, uh, 
for high latitude sailing. And the person that uh, designed it is a guy named Skip Novak, who actually turns out is from Chicago. But if we have any sailors on the call, this guy is an absolute legend in, in the sailing world with respect to, to, to high latitude sailing. And uh, we boarded this boat. There's a crew of three. It's a 77 foot boat that was built in Norway and then sailed down to um, the Falklands. It'll be based out of South Africa, I think, from now on and, and just uh, run trips to the to the uh, to Antarctica and, and the South Polar areas. And so this particular trip we went on uh, was wonderful. We got on the boat. And what I have to say is uh, I've never eaten so well on an expedition in my life. All three uh, uh of the crew were just incredible cooks. Here we are in the first night eating squid on the boat. And then I put a picture here on the left that I'm gonna come back to later in the talk because there weren't a lot of boats around this time that you've, you know, in during the pandemic and things, but there was this one small spit sailboat with a guy on it. And you can see he's got a, a rack of a, some sheep on a, a sheep hanging on the skinned out sheep hanging on the back of his boat. And I'm gonna come back to him later in the talk. But uh, you know, one of the guys on the uh, one of the crew members, Kenneth Pertagon, has written his own cookbook. So again, you know, this was a wonderful trip from that perspective, and it was a wonderful trip in terms of what we were trying to do. And this was not clear up until the last minute that we actually wouldn't have to quarantine in the Falklands, such that we would have only been able to have time to go to the Antarctic Peninsula or South Georgia, but not both. And in the end, we were able to convince the uh, Skip Novak and the the and the folks at Pelagic that, that if we went to the Antarctic Peninsula first, which is not the normal way to go, we could come back to South Georgia, deal with the quarantine issues if there were any and there weren't, um, and then be fine for the rest of the trip. So this is uh, these are eBird lists that were we put uh, we made during the course of the trip. We we left the Falklands, which are 300 miles off the coast of South America there, and headed straight for the Antarctic Peninsula. And you can see the Antarctic Peninsula is this incredible uh, piece of land that's about 800 kilometers long, stretching out from the coast of, from the continent of Antarctica into the, what's called the Scotia Sea. And then this area is called the Drake Passage, which according to many people is one of the roughest uh, seaways in the world. And so along the way, we're, we're making uh, lists. I just wanna also remind people that, um, we're going into the area where Ernest Shackleton and the Endeavor disappeared. And of course it was found uh, earlier this year um, at the cost of many millions of dollars. Um, and it was perfectly preserved where it sunk in the ice back in 1915. Um, but we are gonna retrace what Shackleton did in his little rowboat essentially, as we go from the Antarctic Peninsula to South Georgia. So once you get out in the open ocean, you, you immediately start seeing an avifauna, a set of birds that are just uh, completely different from anything I had a lot of experience with. So this is a giant petrel. It's a it's a either a young bird or a dark morph. And here's another giant petrel, southern giant petrel. Um, and these are these heavy bodied uh, long birds, which will, uh, long winged birds, which will come back up later on in the talk. Um, there are pterodroma petrels, such as soft plumage petrel flying around. Um, again, medium-sized petrels with long wings. Antarctic prions, which are smaller birds that are uh, often in, in quite large numbers. And these guys nest on South Georgia. And so they're moving around across large swaths of ocean to, to feed um, during the breeding season and then in the post-breeding season. And remember that we left Chicago on December 27th, which is basically the height of spring and summer in the Southern hemisphere. So we're down to experience summer temperatures. Temperatures ranged across the trip from uh, anywhere from about 20 degrees to about 40 degrees. And of course, one of the things you wanna see in the open ocean are albatrosses. And to be honest with you, I had actually been on numerous uh, pelagic trips off San Diego as a kid and never done it at the right time of year. And I had never seen an albatross before. And so this is, a, I think, a gray-headed albatross in the distance. But as you get out there, there are multiple species. This is black-browed albatross, uh, which uh, is quite common uh, right around the Falklands because there's a large breeding colony there. 
Um, this is gray-headed albatross. That This is a bird that doesn't breed in the Falklands, but breeds on South Georgia. This is light-mantled albatross. And again, another bird that breeds in South Georgia. And, and some of these species are colonial. Um, light-mantled tend to be solitary nesters. They find cliff faces uh, on these uh, montane islands that are, that are out away from the Antarctic Peninsula. And then, of course, the thing you really want to see is, is wandering albatross. And, and I have to say that, that they live up to every expectation I ever had. It's an interesting bird biologically um, because recent studies have shown that um, there are somewhere around seven breeding populations um, scattered across all around Antarctica. And every single one of those is genetically distinct. So it's very likely that in the coming years, people will begin to talk about uh, alba wandering albatross as actually being uh, seven different species because of the population genetics of the birds. You do see them on the water once in a while, although not very often. And, and these birds are going out from their nesting sites and in places like South Georgia and covering thousands of kilometers to forage for their uh, for their uh, chicks back on the back on the islands. So you go for about five days across the Scotia Sea, and dawn comes one morning, and you've reached the Antarctic Peninsula, and now you're between. The islands on the we're going down the the western side of the peninsula, and there are islands buffering you from the sea. And suddenly, everything's completely calm, and you're just in a completely different world of ice and snow and rock. And it's just incredibly beautiful. This is uh, you can see ice in the water, and that's Sushma Reddy, who's the curator of birds at the Bell Museum, um, who is one of the co PIs on the trip. There. Are animals like humpbacked whales uh, around you foraging. And in the foreground there are Southern fulmars. And again, these landscapes just keep getting more and more amazing as, as you continue south along these channels. And just to give you an idea how big some of the glaciers are, that's a four story boat. There were very few uh, uh, commercial vessels in the region this year because wow. almost half the companies decided to cancel all their trips because of COVID. And those that didn't were running on half capacity. So there was not a lot of traffic here, which is, you know, you're just reminded every once in a while that you're the only people probably for several hundred miles in any direction, much of the time that you're on this, uh, that we were on this trip. But you can see here that this glacier is, is a huge amount of ice uh, coming down into the, to this strait. You can start to begin to see the pieces that have calved off and 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 begin to form icebergs and the bluish color sometimes is a, is a tip off to that. And then you can see as you get closer and the water hits uh, the, the light hits the water at different levels, the colors can change dramatically and just be absolutely stunning as there's more fresh water um, in the immediate area in this photo. And then, of course, this is what we came for. We came for penguins and you start seeing penguins. These are four or three chin straps sitting on a little patch of ice. And as you get a little farther south, you start to see a few more penguins. And this is a mixture of chin straps and Antarctic Gen 2s. And then suddenly we reach the destination that we're looking for, which is a place called Port Lockroy, which is the southernmost inhabited uh, or post office in the world, basically. But there was nobody there this time of year because the vessels weren't coming in and so it wasn't uh, manned. But what you can see here are Jintu penguin colonies um, below these incredible mountains. And as you get closer, you can start seeing the lines that the Jintu penguins are uh, making to get up to areas that are free of snow where they can build their nests. And this is one of the species that, that we were interested in. Um, here are the, the women that are, that are part of this trip. Uh, Jane Younger, again, is an Australian who's now at the University of Tasmania. Rachel Herman's a graduate student from uh, uh, SUNY Stony Brook in, in New York. Sushma Reddy, again, is from the Bell Museum. Gemma Klukas is a postdoc at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And then finally, Katie O'Brien is a graduate student at uh, the University of Bath in the UK. And all these women had uh, research projects for which we were there to collect data for. We were trying to sample fecal samples and, and blood samples from as many penguins as we could in order to do genetic studies and diet studies um, as part of uh, 
various research project that's, that we these women had. And, you know, just in the right before the trip, not long before the trip, one of uh, Jane's uh, students published a, a paper putting together morphometric and genetic evidence for there being four species of gentoo penguins. So I said that wandering albatross is likely to be seven species based on its breeding biology. Well, it, when you sample things from uh, the Antarctic Peninsula, gentoo penguins from the Antarctic Peninsula, South Georgia, the Falklands, and then over in Kerguelen Island, which is on the other side of, of, of Antarctica, you find out that there's uh, what we call reciprocal monophyly, meaning there's no evidence of gene flow in the genetic data between these populations. And, and uh, Gemma and Sushma and Jane and their colleagues were arguing that these should be different species, but they wanted to get more data from more populations and, and, and better understand some of the various characteristics of these Gentoo species across this geography. So one of the things you'll see across the course of this talk is how much the Gentoo penguins change in terms of what they're doing, where they're breeding. And then of course, because of the time of year, you'll see the chicks get bigger too, as we go along. So again, we're the only people around. There's a lot of rules on the boat about how to be uh, thoughtful and careful with respect to uh, cleaning your gear and not transporting things around. Um, this becomes particularly important when you get up to uh, warmer places like South Georgia and, and uh, the Falklands. But uh, we're always thinking about safety of the group and, and how we're moving around. And, and we're basically going out and working on these colonies of these birds. These are the stars of the show. And as Rena said, I mean, no matter what you've heard about penguins uh, and how cute you think they are, they're cuter in, in real life in these areas. You know, they're just absolutely wonderful animals. Um, and the landscapes they're in are just absolutely breathtaking. So this is the skipper. Uh, we would use this uh, Zodiac to get out to sites, and then we would be able to go to work, and the sites were in all kinds of different places. Uh, what you can see there on the left is uh, in that reddish-brown stuff. That's all guano. So these are penguin droppings, and you're basically landing and spending the day <laughs> going around the penguin colony gathering samples. This is Irby Lovett, who's one of the professors in the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, and again, I can't express enough that it, for the most part, penguins are as interested in you as you are in them. And so they're just kind of, they're just incredibly fascinating animals. And they're often not alone at their colonies. So this is one of the first places we went. And, and this is a Weddell seal that was actually sleeping for probably three hours or so and picked its head up for maybe 30 seconds before it went back to sleep and just looked at us and, and decided just, we weren't anything to worry about. So again, we were there collecting blood and fecal material. This is fecal material of a penguin, and it's almost entirely krill. You can tell by the color. And krill is a, is a crustacean. Uh, it's a whole group of crustaceans. But in Antarctica and off the Antarctic, in the Antarctic Ocean, krill forms uh, a lot of the biomass that whales and penguins and all these other creatures actually depend on. Once you get to the offshore islands, you get uh, uh, different surfaces. These are much rockier. And uh, you can see here, these, these Gentoos are, are using a very uh, stony substrate. Straight. They're gathering pebbles uh, from around there to build up their, their nest platforms. And you can see the boat there in the background. And in some of these colonies along the coast, we would, we would pick up chinstrap penguins too. And chinstraps are, are like Gentoos. They're more of a mid uh, Antarctic area species. Um, and as you'll see over the course of this talk, some of the species are only found at, in, in much warmer areas. And then there's one other species that we were hoping to find down here, which we did find a, a, a few small numbers of, and that was a deli penguin. And the deli penguin was in, uh, there were a few deli penguins uh, in a couple of the colonies. Um, this is the, these are the the northernmost populations of Adeli penguin for the most part. Adeli, like emperor penguin, is a bird that's more of the primary Antarctic peninsula. And yet a few populations uh, move up here. And they're just, they're a, a spectacular little bird. And, and one of the things I'm fascinated by is morphologically, I don't know of many birds whose eyes appear to be sort of set at basically the side of their bill um, where their gape is. 
and so they're they're a really um, interesting bird in terms of their morphology and and I'd like to know more about what they do in terms of their feeding habits. Penguins aren't the only thing. There are populations of things like uh, Antarctic shags, which are which is a species of cormorant from down here, and and uh, they're quite colorful looking um, with their blue eye rings and and big. Uh, 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 skin patches on their uh, on the top of their nares. And so I just want to remind you here that that we'll see how this goes as penguins are aquatic species. And that's something that struck me over and over again towards the course of the trip is, is you see them all that we're working with them all the time on land. But, you know, this is what they're really good at, and really adapted for. And this is a mixture of gin twos and chin straps just right off one of the colonies, just going around, there's probably some krill uh, down on the bottom and, and they're just, they're going down and, and getting samples and then coming, you know, getting food and then coming back up. And, and again, you're in this area where the only, you know, there are no airplanes going over, there are no sirens. There's, you know, this is a special part of the world. So one of the things you immediately see too, though, is that sometimes the penguins are going around like this. These are some of these Gentoo penguins and they're in a big group. And the reason they're in big groups like that is that there are predators in the area. This is a leopard seal. And these guys are very poorly known in terms of their biology. They're not very, uh, they're not in high densities at all. There's usually one or two individuals hanging around a given colony. And they're just incredibly ferocious predators capable of basically catching a penguin and physically turning it inside out, just pulling the skin out to get the body out and eating them. And uh, I'll come back to, to uh, leopard seals a little later on. And because of all this, there there's scavengers out here. So here's a, one example of a scavenger. This is the, one of the larger ones, um, South Polar Skua. And then there's also this incredible bird called uh, Snowy Sheathbill. And there are only two species of sheath bills in the world, and they're entirely found on, in Antarctica and, and occasionally reach up to places like South Africa. And they look like a cross between a, a pigeon and a, and a gull, I guess. I don't know. But uh, they're capable of flying out over the ocean, open ocean, because they leave the Antarctic Peninsula in the Antarctic winter and spend the winter in, in uh, places like the Falkland Islands. And so they are capable of moving, but they spend almost all their, their time hanging around the colonies scavenging. And one of the things I find interesting as an evolutionary biologist is that if you look at the ages of the groups that these birds are part of, um, you can trace back the lineages of penguins and their their uh, uh, these animals that are scavenging around the penguin colonies back about 25 million years. So this is a set of interactions that's been going on for a very, very long time. So one thing we were not sure we were going to be able to do on this trip was uh, uh, do much collecting in the sense of uh, of in this case, uh, salvaging material that we found. But it turns out that a lot of eggs on penguin colonies get robbed by skuas and, and taken to the side and opened up. And so we were able to find a number of eggs to, to collect at the various sites. And the goal is to look at the differences in egg structure between these areas that include the Antarctic Peninsula, South Georgia, and the Falkland Islands. We were also collecting uh, vocal data, which uh, was uploaded to the Macaulay Library at Cornell. And this is Jacob in all his gear, um, recording a couple of kelp gulls that are flying over. In addition, and this is a, the researchers that work in Antarctica tend to be a fairly um, diverse and widespread group, but they're also fairly well networked. And so one of the things that Gemma was doing for some of her colleagues was uh, reloading batteries that people hadn't been able to get to for almost a year on some of these uh, uh, penguin colonies. And one of the great things about these sites is it, these, these cameras is they take a picture every day, which gives you an idea of the weather conditions and how they're changing on a much more fine scale for these penguin colonies over the course of a, of a season. So I just wanted to 
to remind people that although this is a spectacularly remote area, it's being access, accessed a lot more by people. And I would say that's a good thing. And yet at the same time, and once we got back, there was a paper that I, I noticed online that, that was published that was basically looking at black carbon, which is essentially soot that comes out of, of diesel or diesel engines and is getting on the snow. And the researchers estimate that this is leading to decreased snow coverage um, to some extent across the entire parts of the uh, Antarctic Peninsula that people are visiting. And so, you know, it's just a reminder that, that and this will be clear over the course of this talk, that even in a place as remote as this, humans have some kind of uh, impact and activity with their activities. All right, so I said this was an ambitious talk, so now we're going to work our way back to South Georgia. And just because I forgot to say this, this triangle between South Georgia, the Falklands, and then the Antarctic Peninsula is about the same as, a, as going from Chicago to New Orleans to Denver and then back to Chicago. So, you know, this is not a small distance to travel by sailboat. And again, we're getting out in the ocean to go for probably another four days, four and a half days to get to South Georgia now. Um, and again, I'm reminded, I was reminded of how oceanic these penguins really are when you see a group of chin straps several miles off the, the Antarctic Peninsula, the islands on the northern tip of the Antarctic Peninsula out foraging. And of course, on board, we have to spend a lot of time together. So we managed to do quite well in terms of getting along. Um, and as I said, the food was wonderful, but just I wanted to give you an idea what the Scotia Sea can potentially be like and how the boat's designed to handle them. So if you'll notice, there's an armature on the stove for those pressure cookers that allows them to basically rotate with the rolling of the boat. And uh, Kenneth here is, is cleaning up. Everything is bolted down or, or tied down so that it won't open as the boat rocks. And we're gonna scan across the, the flip here and you'll see uh, Bryce Johnson, who's a graduate student in the Cornell lab and a spectacular artist working. And then you'll see what out from the out the portal of the boat what the what the ocean is. There's Bryce working away despite the fact that the ship is rolling. And then you can begin to see what these southern oceans look like on a day that's probably not all that rough, but uh, certainly rough enough. And as the boat goes up and down, water will eventually come over the top of the portal. And the boat is literally rocking enough that uh, it can be pretty hard to stay steady. And, and everybody's different. I got seasick a number of times on the various trips, um, but I always got better. And other people were a lot, had a lot, it affected them a lot more. But once again, you travel all across this rough ocean and dawn comes and, and you've reached the uh, the eastern tip of South Georgia Island on the north side. And suddenly you get into these bays where it's completely calm again. So we're still south of what's called the polar front, which is where the cold water of the Antarctic Ocean meets up with the, the, the Atlantic Ocean in this region. Um, and this is what South Georgia looks like. And this is the actual uh, chart or the, or the recording of the of the ship's uh, sensor um, for where we went. And this is why you take a sailboat like this, which is that we had complete freedom to chart the areas we wanted to go to and get into these uh, little areas, um, all of which have colonies of, of penguins and, and, and do the kind of sampling that we wanted to do. Also, I'll point out that this is the area, you'll notice that that area in white, that's all glaciers and mountains. And <clears throat> when Shackleton came across in his boat, I still think one of the most amazing things is that he had to land on the south side of, of the South Georgia and get over the top of the mountains there uh, to get to the whaling stations that were on the north side. And this is what this looks like from, from the north side as you're driving along. In the, or sailing along in the boat to different spots. 
again, South Georgia has a long history of human uh, activities. The Europeans and the Americans came down in the uh, late 1800s um, and into the all the way into the 1950s, harvesting whales and and uh, fur seals and uh, just not really thinking about anything else other than how many animals they could actually cache and process. And so there are a number of large uh, decaying uh, processing stations along the North Shore of, of South Georgia today. This is Grid Vicken, which is the only habited uh, place on all of South Georgia. And they've turned it into a museum to a uh, essentially and and you can see some of the old whaling boats and what they what they looked like and then you can also notice that in the foreground there's a bunch of sea lion uh, fur seals and you'll see this over and over again on south georgia um, <clears throat> fur seals have come back dramatically since the times when they were harvested by the thousands by visiting uh, sealers there's a little uh, cemetery in grit Bicken, which is famous for being where uh, 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 what's his name is buried out uh, with his head towards the South Pole. Um, what I want to emphasize here, though, is that for me, I was more taken by the grave of a of a Argentine seaman, and it's easy to forget that in 1982, humans actually fought a war over South Georgia and the Falkland Islands, mm -hmm. and this was he, he was the only fatality. He was shot on a on a submarine um, that the British had captured in South Georgia, Shackleton. So this is Shackleton's grave um, in in South Georgia at Grid Bicken. I said before that one of the things that they're really worried about is they're you're constantly told as you're going ashore to make sure that you've cleaned out all your stuff that you've looked through all the seams on your uh, your Gore-Tex and, and, and things to make sure there are no seeds there. And when you get on shore, you can see why. So here's a native uh, uh, plant with the, the red heads, but I think most of you have probably already figured out what the plant in the middle is. It's a dandelion. And uh, we were told by some of the conservationists that we met at, at one of the, at, around Grid Bicken that they don't, not sure they'll be able to exterminate uh, dandelions. At the same time, South Georgia's had some major success stories. And perhaps the biggest one is in the late 1990s and, and early 2000s, they began to uh, try to eradicate mice and rats from the island. And they were successfully able to do it. And if you look at the literature, one of the things you'll find is there, there are endemic birds, including the, the southernmost uh, endemic passerine bird in the world called uh, South Georgia pipit that were beginning to be found only on the offshore islands where there weren't rats and mice. And yet since 2000 and the eradication, one of the neat things about that is these birds have come back. Now, you'll see that, that here are a couple of my colleagues, again, landing on South Georgia is just incredible because of what you get to see. So the sea line, the first seals are so thick along the beaches that you're literally required to carry a stick and the stick is not to hit them, but the stick is literally to point it at them, and, and they will, uh, they can be somewhat aggressive and, and hint that they're going to charge you. But as long as you have something out in front of them, they'll they'll actually come back. And so you can see a couple of my colleagues cleaning themselves off after a day on shore. And again, they're literally all along the beaches. There's a, a male and and females. The males are are quite large and this time of year because the pups are actually uh, fairly far along they're not quite as territorial and just to give you an idea what it sounds like I wanted to, to play this for you. So this is the typical sound on the beaches of these fur seals just going 24 hours a day during this time of year. And this king penguin has just uh, come to shore, and I'll come back to king, king penguins in just a second.
So a lot of these beaches are literally just thick with, with baby fur seals this time of year. Here's a skua. And then these are molting uh, king penguins, which I'll come back to uh, a little later in the talk. And there's Jane. So there's South Georgia Pipit. Again, this is the southernmost uh, breeding passerine bird in the world. Um, and the, we found it to be present in every single site we went to. Whereas if you look at the literature from around 2000, they literally are telling people that, that the, these birds are beginning to be found only on the offshore islands because of the rats and, and mice. And again, those have been eradicated. There's also an endemic pintail. And again, this was, we've had these birds at every site and sometimes big numbers up to, we had up a, a group of up to 80 at one of the sites. So that they've become, they've come back to the mainland in, in big numbers. And here you can see both endemic birds together and recognize that even these birds are, are actually using the penguin colonies for food. And there's really only one species of insect on South Georgia, it's a little fly and they definitely like the penguin colonies. And there's a pipit in the foreground and then a, a, a South Georgia pintail um, around this colony of Jintu penguins. And, and notice that the Jintu penguins now aren't breeding on rocks. They're actually breeding on what was tussock and it's fairly wet. And also that the chicks are now or have gone from being quite small, which is what they were on the Antarctic Peninsula to being much larger now. And that's partly because these birds on South Georgia are able to start breeding much earlier and time's passing. Now there are other marine mammals that are that are pulling up on the beaches. These are Southern elephant seals and they're pulling up this time of year. These are actually just young ones for the most part, but they're pulling up to, um, to basically molt. They shed their skin uh, um, in big thick rolls of, of, of uh, skin along the beaches this time of year. And then they also jostle for space with one another. So these are probably young males. I mean, you can already see that they hold some of these scars that they'll get over the course of their lifetimes. All right, so now I wanna come back to that picture I showed you of the guy leaving the Falklands, Stanley in the Falklands a while ago. This is his boat, it's the Peregrine. His name is Leif Ponset and he's the son of the primary, the foremost conservation biologist in the Falklands and South Georgia, Sally Ponset. And he sailed by himself to South Georgia. And it turns out our captain is, uh, uh, owns an island in South Georgia, or in, in the Falklands, sorry, and uh, knows Leaf fairly well and invited him over for dinner one night on our boat when we met up in one of the harbors, uh, one, of the, one of the bays that we were stopping in, 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 uh, in South Georgia. And during dinner, he said to us, well, you guys are ornithologists. When I was sailing across the, uh, between the Falklands and South Georgia, this yellow bird with a gray back landed on my boat. And this was later in the evening and people thought about it a little bit and nobody thought much more about it. And the next day, Leaf was leaving the harbor and stopped by our boat to say hi. And he came on board and he said, John, here's, here's, here's the picture I took of this bird and my jaw just hit the absolute ground. <gasps> so I think everybody will probably recognize this as a prothonotary warbler. <laughs> that red arrow is where he was and the yellow and blue are, are the breeding and wintering range as a prothonotary warbler. So this bird, I keep saying the best bird on the trip was something that we never saw. But this is just an incredible record of a North American bird that is clearly way off course. Although I will point out that about the same time of year, this is now we're talking mid-January, um, some of the researchers on the Galapagos working on Galapagos finches had a prothonotary warbler show up on one of their field sites. So prothonotaries clearly can get around and who knows what happened to this bird, but he landed on a little sailboat out in the middle of nowhere and somebody was smart enough to take a picture of him. Again, on the Antarctic Peninsula, there are almost no plants and you get to South Georgia and suddenly you're seeing uh, things like bryophytes and lichens and, and, and the lot. So the diversity goes a lot up, long, a long ways up and that's loud, largely a slide for my botany friends. Um, but there is some really interesting botanizing that can be done on these sites. 
One of the other things the folks from Cornell had done was they'd gotten licenses to be able to fly drones. And this was allowing Gemma to gather data for her colleagues on some other neat aspects of these colonies, which is to basically get a picture of colony size through aerial photography. And so this is a chinstrap penguin colony at South Georgia. And this is what the tiled together photographs look like of that colony um, on the right. And so Gemma is working through those data to, to look at those. And again, all this provides baseline for, for future work. So I've said, you know, you've already seen how Jintu penguins appear to like elevated habitat or places in a lot of their breeding sites. It was interesting to get to South Georgia and see that that was still true. So here's a picture of, of a typical um, island or site along the shore in South Georgia. You've got a big mass of tussock grass. You've got uh, on the right hand side, you've got elephant seals pulled up all along. You've got uh, fur seals. You've got a group of uh, king penguins in the middle. Oftentimes there are fur seals hiding in the tussock grass. And so you have to be very careful when you're walking through it. And a lot of times it's over your head and you can't see what's around the next corner and it could be a, a fur seal. So you have to be careful. And then if you look at where the green ends on the right-hand side of the highest hump there in the center part of this screen, what you'll see is a, some things that look like white dots. And that's another Jintu penguin colony. And so we hiked up there to, to work on those birds. And this is what it looks like looking back the other direction. And you'll notice actually there's a very large boat on the left-hand side of the screen. That was the only truly large uh, uh, commercial uh, vessel that we saw um, the entire time. It was a French vessel that was basically there for probably three hours before it headed off down to the Antarctic Peninsula. And, and you know, the women on our trip have actually been able to do their research sometimes working on these kinds of tourist vessels. Um, but one of their, the problems is the vessels have a limited amount of time and keep moving. And so one of the great things for them on this trip was that we could literally spend all day working on the colonies and, and gathering data. So here's one of the next penguin species that we were able to work with, which is macaroni penguin. Um, I like to call them the toucan of the penguin family from my perspective. They, they really are just wonderful looking birds. And they're part of this genus uh, Eudiptes that is known for liking to nest in rocky habitats and, and, and also to go up very steep slopes to get to them. So this is a... Uh, colony of probably close to a thousand birds. Um, and it was actually so wet and rainy the time we were there that we decided it wasn't safe for us to try to, to work our way up these cliff faces to try to, to work with this, with this particular colony of macaroni penguins. And so, you know, they're quite able to, to get to places. And just to the right of that colony is a large colony of gray-headed albatrosses. And we were able to get to at least one or two nests uh, close to one or two nests on the edge of, of one of the colonies there. And, and, and again, they're just absolutely spectacular birds. These, uh, all, all these penguin species are, are very doting parents. One member of the pair will go off and forage and then relieve the other pair. And as they get bigger, you can see these chicks are, are you're not gonna sit on top of them. But, uh, but they're still watching over them. And at the same time, they have these occasional disputes with their neighbors, which is this, I caught this on camera, and you can see the, the ridges on the inside of the, the roof of the mouth, which are probably designed to help with uh, holding on to fish and things like that. So just to give you an idea what these colonies sound like, they can be very noisy. And so I wanted to play uh, South Georgia Jintu penguin and then macaroni penguin. You can also see that the, the chicks are very good at uh, spinning excrement out away from the nest. Mm -hmm. 
you know, those, these chicks are, are still basically some, some if, at this period of time, they're growing so fast and they're so fat, but a lot of times they're just laying around um, because they can't move that well, but that'll change very quickly. Macaroni can do. Now I'll get the king penguin. Again, probably my favorite. It's an incredible bird. They're about uh, three feet tall. Um, they're just absolutely majestic as adults. Um, and it, again, they're dealing with the other animals around them. This is a young elephant seal that was cutting off one of the streams that the birds were going up. What do you do if you're an emperor penguin in that case? I guess you just wait. And South Georgia is famous for the size of these colonies. So here's a group of South uh, or of king penguins. You can see some of the juveniles in the front. I'll come back to that in a second. But this colony has 50,000 birds in it. So you can't even begin to get it in a single photograph in, in many ways. And you can see that there are young birds uh, uh, spread out through that entire thing. This is what these young birds look like. And it's an amazing biology story because they spend 10 months on the on the shore before they're they're ready to begin to molt to get back in, to, to get into the ocean for the first time. And so the adults are having to go out and feed them all through the winter and into the next year. And then there are these molting birds and, and they look like absolutely miserable individuals a lot of times with these mixtures of, of this, this juvenile plumage and, and getting into their adult plumage. And so, you know, how you find your offspring or your mate in a, in a population of 50,000 uh, or 100,000 king penguins, I have no idea, but they've clearly figured it out over the, the time that they've uh, evolved on these wonderful islands. And every once in a while you're, you're doing your work and you look back and you realize what the landscape looks like and, and what kind of place you're in. And it's just absolutely amazing. Now, again, penguin lives are, are tough. This is a bird we spotted that had come up on shore. If you notice that that shape of that is a half circle, which is almost, well, it, it's, it's a leopard seal basically has gotten this adult penguin and it's come ashore. And then if you look on the right, you can see the head of a giant petrel. And this giant petrel was just doing everything it could to jab at this wound and make it worse. And you start realizing that that it's not a good idea to get injured even around these scavengers in this part of the world. And giant petrels are fascinating in terms of their biology. So they're still, they forage out at sea. And yet at the same time, you'll see them with sticking their heads into incredibly fetid uh, uh, carcasses of uh, fur seals and having no qualms about it. So they're, they're just, they're spectacular uh, uh, scavengers. We were able to scavenge a few specimens for the museum, uh, in, for two museums, for the Bell Museum in Minnesota and for us um, from skeletons. And then we had one or two fresh carcasses that we found that we that we actually skinned. So now we're back to the Falklands. And I'm just gonna spend a couple of minutes really quickly finishing up on the Falklands. They're a very different island. Now we're north of the polar front. Um, it's very flat, it's very uh, British. It's uh, despite what the Argentinians think, it's covered in sheep, um, and the sheep is uh, a sheep is on the very logo for the um, for the islands. And we were lucky enough to go out to again. There, there's there are introduced rats and cats and mice on all the big islands, such that a lot of the native fauna. And there are now 63 species of birds here, including 16 endemics like the striated caracara. 
but a lot of these birds uh, have been pushed out to where they're only found on the outlying islands. And we went to a spectacular place called Sea Lion Island, which is the southernmost inhabited island um, in the Falklands. And there's a, a, a place you can stay there that's run by a spectacular couple. The island's about four kilometers long, and it's it's filled with most of the uh, the birds that you can see in the Falklands. These are steamer ducks, which uh, some populations actually have lost the ability to fly. Um, and it, they're found in the in Southern Argentina and Chile, but they've gotten out to the Falklands. This is a female kelp goose, which is, a, there are four species in this genus Clofaga that have, that have gotten out to the Falklands that, that also inhabit the Southern tip of South America. And then there are things that are slightly more familiar. This is a member of the genus Turtus, just like our American robin, except it's at the endemic species austral uh, thrush to the Falklands. Then there are little things like this uh, white bridled finch, um, which is an endemic species to the uh, uh, endemic species in Argentina, but that gets out to the Falklands. And then this is a meadowlark, again from southern South America, that's reached the Falklands. And then I'm guessing. People know what this is because you're going to have a talk about this in a little <laughs> while, but this is a black crowned night heron. But again, black crowned night heron has gotten all over the world. And in a place like the Falklands, it's gotten there and the gene pool is considered distinct enough that, that people are beginning to call it a, a separate species. So one of the great things about these Places like the Falklands, as you have a chance to see some of the other marine mammals, this, these are these are Antarctic fur seals that we saw that looked like they were scared about something. And a little while <laughs> later, we realized what they were scared on. This is a pod of four killer whales, two adults and two juveniles that were clearly following these fur seals and keeping track of them. And had they gone back into the water, they would have probably been dinner. But again, we were here because they're, they're penguins. And in this case, there are three species. These are Falkland Gentoo penguins, and you can see they're on these uh, tussock grass areas. And now the chicks are so big that they're actually following around the adults like Keystone cops trying to, to get the adults to give them food. And they're they're really beginning to get old enough to, to go back out and to, to go out for the first time into the open ocean. The other species that are here are Magellanic penguin, um, which is in the genus Phoniscus, and this is the same uh, genus as uh, Galapagos penguin and uh, another species in South Africa. And then the last bird that I want to mention is, is this guy, which people may be able to guess is a rockhopper penguin, and this is a southern rockhopper penguin, and they're absolutely beautiful little birds living on these rocks, and not only are they living on these rocks, just like the macaroni penguins, they like breeding sites that are in unbelievable places relative to the ocean. So this is a probably about a 100, 120 foot cliff with a narrow crevice that these rockhopper penguins are literally going up and down all the time to feed their young during the breeding season. And it, it, it just, I, it was unbelievable. And this day the wind was blowing out across the, uh, this area at about 40 kilometers a mile, uh, an hour. And I wouldn't get near the edge because I didn't want to get blown off. But out on the ocean, there were black browed albatrosses going by. There, There's a big colony of shags along the uh, uh, cliffs. And it's just an absolutely amazing place. And so I'm going to finish there. And I just, you know, there's a bunch of people to acknowledge. I'm really appreciative of all the governments and and the, the crew that we had was just absolutely amazing. And everybody was really generous with their time, uh, like Sally Ponsett and, and Mickey Reeves and Sarah Crofts at Sea Lion Island. And then, of course, this was all about the penguins. And, and we got an incredible data set. Um, again, if you're interested in more photos of some of the other birds, you can go on the trip report. And I'll just finish up by saying that, that you know, here's this uh, Magellanic penguin going off to the ocean on an incredible busy day and, and or windy day with very high seas. And you realize that these birds are out there just doing what they've been doing for millions of years. And I sure hope we figure out ways to make sure that they continue doing that for millions of years into the future. Thanks very much. Well, <laughs> uh, I I would have loved to be on that adventure except for the uh, the rocking of the boat, but <laughs> amazing, amazing. Thank you, John. Um, I did start a couple of, I think Sunny and I both had a couple of uh, questions. I'm sure that people 
have more, but um, I'll start a uh, couple of things. First of all, how many species of penguin are in, there in the world? Right. So right now there are about 28 or so, depending on your taxonomy. And, and one of the reasons why, I mean, ornithologists are ornithologists and uh, some people haven't accepted the arguments for the Jintu species. Um, but if you look at if you look at most penguins genera, what you'll find is like, for instance, in the in Eudiptes, the rockhopper genus, there's an awful lot of geographic populations that have become more differentiated in plumage than than the Jintus are, but they're probably equally genetically distinct. Okay, and I was also going to ask um, because you were, I mean, obviously the islands had different habitat and and everything, but. Was there something you said a little bit about this? I put this question in the chat before you mentioned some of this, but is there something, is there some reason why you had, you know, one island with three species and another island with three different species? Is it habitat? Is there climate difference? Is there? Yeah. So, so, so what I would say is, is uh, it's, it's sort of goes with, harshness of climate as, as you uh, get to higher and higher latitudes. So if you start in, in Antarctica, you've got one species breeding in the middle of Antarctica and that's, that's emperor penguin. And then as you get close to the edge of the Antarctic continent, you pick up a deli penguin. And then as you move up and get a little bit uh, into a little bit nicer areas along the peninsula is when you start picking up gentoos um, and macaronis and chin straps. And then the genus Finiscus is definitely adapted for even more warm climates. Now, how, I mean, it's, there's still, uh, there's still pelagic birds that are going out in the ocean to feed, but but obviously Humboldt penguins have made it all the way to the Galapagos and been able to, to survive out there, in part because that's a, a, a often a cold, clim, uh, cold current area with a lot of upwellings for them. Okay. Um, Sunny asked, how did it smell? <laughs> you know, I guess what I would say is not good, but at the same time, it's like, you're out there by yourself and, and uh, you don't smell very good after a while either. And so you, you, just, you just don't worry about, I mean, it's definitely a messy job handling penguins. And, and so, but, but, you know, for the, for the researchers, you're together all the time. The entire focus is doing the, is getting the data that we're trying to get. And so I, it's just, it just never bothered me that much, but, but that's definitely, something I've gotten used to over the years in various places. Okay, um, Jack is asking to you to talk a little bit more about how the motion sickness was handled. You can see we're all like, ah. Yeah, no, that's, <laughs> I, it's, I, uh, it, so the trip was about 30, 38 days long or so. And and what I'd say is, is you know, you, you're given a lot of, uh, uh, coaching with respect to what you might try. So there are patches and what I found out is the patches don't stick to me very well for reasons I can't explain. So, <laughs> so the patches didn't work, but I started taking Dramamine and, and Dramamine worked fine for me. And then there were several of my colleagues who literally would disappear for four or five days at a time. Oh. Including hardcore penguin researchers, which I found fascinating. So, I mean, it's not, and, and, and I don't think there's anything they can do. They just literally know that this is going to happen and they'll come up and eat some crackers at some point. And then by the time the water gets, you know, you get into the bays and things, it's calm again and, and they come back out and they're ready to go. That would be a big deterrent for me, but <laughs> um, let's see. Oh, that's uh, an interesting question. Do the, yeah. do, do the different species interbreed? I don't know of any evidence of that. I don't know of anybody. That's a, I, I will have to look into that. But I have I have known have no knowledge of there being hybrid penguins, which is a very interesting thing. And and I'll I'll give you an example of of that because we were on one of the outlying islands on the Antarctic Peninsula, and it was a colony of gentoos and chin straps that probably had I don't know up to six hundred to a thousand pairs of both of those species, and 
there were two or three macaroni penguin nesting within that colony. So the crazy thing there is they had to get there and they had to find a mate in order to reproduce. And so I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know how, whether the, uh, you know, macaroni penguins in that case are traveling around as a pair in the ocean and get lost and then end up colonizing these sites. I mean, one of the, one of the research projects of uh, one of the graduate students is to look into Jintu penguins on the Antarctic Peninsula because they're actually gradually moving further south on the peninsula. And it's very possible that that's the result of global warming that's opening up areas for them to breed. And so that species is doing well enough that, that it's actually expanding its populations, which probably means that there aren't enough good nesting sites in some of the areas towards the tip of the peninsula, such that in individuals are looking for other places along the peninsula over time. You can see the chat, so I'm going to let you look. Uh... Just a few more yeah, questions. So how are, how are rats and mice eradicated? So, so they use uh, 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 poison tra trap boxes. And the good news on this, these places is there's probably not another, a, a lot of other things to eat the poison. And so it's, it's actually not as unreasonable or difficult a thing to do as it is here, for instance. Um, but it can be harder in some places than others. And I actually think it was possible in South Georgia, largely because the island is so glaciated that there really is just a narrow band of habitable vegetation for rats and mice and everything else right along the coast. And they were able to go in and, and, and do that. There's another island um, in, the, in the, this part of the world called Gao or G-O-U-G-H, uh, which you may have heard of. And, there was an there's an endemic finch there and um there all these islands have gotten rats on them if if the if the early uh europeans and and sealers and whalers got there um and they just tried to they had a big push to get rid of rats and mice and weren't able to do it and once if you aren't able to do it completely obviously they're rats and mice and the population start coming back really quickly and so they're trying to decide what to do on gal so it's a it's a big challenge. Okay, there you missed one from Terry. So let's do that one, and then Genesis, and then we'll call it a night. Yeah, will there be any special penguin exhibit at the? Well, you know there already are some some exhibits on penguins. Um, we're actually talking to Peggy McNamara. We've got a, a book proposal in the works, so we want to do a little uh, book along the lines of the series that Peggy's done over the years. And so that's the thing we're really thinking about. Um, no, but but uh, you know, for example, because of the salvage work, we were able to average, you know, add five new species of of, of skeletal material uh, of penguins to the collection, and you know, we've got some penguin researchers that are very interested in getting access to that material. Okay. Who is, yeah, yeah. Who is the good question? So so the so the governments of these places are very interesting. The Falklands are. Uh, have an independent government, but they voted to stay with the part of the British Commonwealth. South Georgia is part of the British Commonwealth. It has a government, but that government all lives in the Falklands. And so the, the only, the only, there only, when we were there, there were only 12 people living at the one research station at Gridviken in, in South Georgia. But, but so one of the reasons why I know all this is in order to get permits, you have to deal with all these different agencies. The Antarctica is an entirely different thing. So we were able to do everything associated with our trip through the uh, US government because the US government is, issues permits to, to US researchers. But that's also true for Australian researchers. They go through the Australian government. And so Antarctica is governed by a large Antarctic treaty among all the a whole bunch of potential nations including nations that you would never expect would have any interest or had thought about Antarctica at all. Like New Guinea was part of the original Antarctic Treaty. And uh, there's uh, the Spaniards have stations, uh, a bunch of a bunch of countries that, that you might not think of have stations somewhere either on the Antarctic Peninsula or on the, the, the continent. And so, but you get permission through the US government for US researchers going there. 
And yeah, so is... with, with respect to, sorry, Rena, oh. with, with respect to eradicating rats, so that was the folks like Sally Ponset um, and the people in the Falklands that are involved in the South in administering things for South Georgia, making this a decision to go in there. They did other things like there were reindeer on these islands. And so in order to get rid of the reindeer, they actually hired special Norwegian hunters to go in and with helicopters and actually uh, oh. get rid of the reindeer. Euphemistically speaking. <laughs> yeah. Okay. okay, Janice, let's do Janice's question and then we'll uh, call it an evening. Uh, is there aggression between the penguin species? So so what, 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 so I have a picture of a chin strap penguin uh, being harassed. No, it's a chin strap penguin harassing a macaroni penguin. Um, but what I would tell you is penguins are unbelievably docile organisms. And uh, there, you often, I mean, you'll see the nests side by side. I think they, they, they will regularly steal pebbles if that's what the nest substrate is in the area from each other's nests. Um, but outright aggression is actually not very common. I mean, these are, these birds are, I think, I think you can make an argument that, that they're living in a, in a environment that where they have to spend all their time concentrating on raising their young and they really can't afford to waste time doing other stuff. And so they don't. And predation in general on land, if you take away the introduced species, is really non-existent except for the scavengers that are hanging around. And, and so they can afford to put their time and effort into to effectively raising their young and, and they are not very aggressive towards each other at all. I, I never saw king penguins be aggressive to any of the other species. I'm gonna reserve the right to ask the very last question because this just occurred to me and I, I had thought about it before. Is the time of year that you were there, is that their breeding season? Yep. Because so, there were chicks. Yep, so, so, so we went in the height of the summer. So, so the summer starts, um, begins in November. And uh, people recommend if you're doing field work on penguins, um, a lot of the penguins actually nest, begin to nest in uh, uh, December. Um, but the pro one of the problems with going earlier is that's when the fur seals are actually um, pairing up and mating and the males are really aggressive at that time. So it, it's, that's hard. And, and one thing I should point out is the fur seals aren't really aggressive towards the penguins either. So yeah. they're sharing these beaches and, and just walking around next to one another. And you see very little activity between the two. Well, as you can see, everyone loved the program. Thank you so much, John. And um, you, I think you were very lucky to go, but I know you were, there's a reason they chose you. So thank you again for sharing with us. And um, I'm mute, Sunny, so we can all say thank you. Thanks, everyone. No, it, it's my, my pleasure. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. And we'll Thanks, look, everyone. We'll look, we'll look forward to seeing some of you at the museum down Thank the road. You, yep. Yep. Thank you. Good night, Thanks, everyone. everyone. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thanks Good night. for coming. <laughs> oh, Jill Dorfman. Janice Becker. I think I know Janice Becker, too. Oh, I do. Oh, I need leave. That's what I need. Leave. Nina, you know, there was a request by Mike Stein for the. I see. Uh, yeah, I'll have to get that from John. I I wrote I wrote it down, but it might not be. Well, I'll I I think I can find it and send it to him. Okay. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everybody. Bye.